All right. While we're waiting um, to start, if you guys go up in the chat, there is a couple links up there that um, I mentioned to a few people in here earlier. Um, if you don't already follow Dr. A on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or on YouTube, we do have all of those for you right now um, where you can go ahead, click on those and follow them. There are typically a few posts a week um, where you can kind of take the time and reflect, um, take some time for yourself, um, read more about the myth and a more about um, the process that Dr. A uses. Um, everything that she posts is definitely something that's going to help you throughout your day, definitely throughout your week um, with the new midlife process. So I definitely suggest doing that. Um, if you don't have Instagram or Facebook, you can always um, just tune into the post, even if you don't have it, by clicking the link whenever you want. All right, we're going to go ahead and get this started for everyone. So um, at the end, there is going to be a free gift and there are some special offers um, for everyone in the Women's Wisdom Village tonight. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Andrea Slominski. She's also known as Dr. A because her full name is Dr. Andrea Modisette Slominski and that is quite a mouthful. I will not make you all say that. Dr. A is an author, speaker and workshop leader. She's a women's midlife coach. Uh, during her MA and PhD research, she studied the new life stage for women that has emerged over the past 120 years. She's named that new life stage Regency and defines it as women's power years. From her dissertation research and fieldwork, she created a unique coaching method that helps women navigate powerful years. In her coaching, she uses creativity, story, and mythology. Her work is rooted in the proven principles of depth, depth and archetypal psychology guiding Regent women to reclaim their passions, develop their purpose, and rediscover their true north. Um, she inspires her clients to live their most authentic lives in service of the greater good. Since starting her practice in 2015, Dr. A has helped over 3,000 women. She has her MA and PhD in Mythological Studies and Depth Psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute, and she's a five-time Joseph Campbell Scholarship Award winner. Here's Dr. A for everyone. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks, Morgan, for that um, introduction. And um, yeah, we have um, quite a few people registered tonight, so they may be popping in or something may have come up and they may not be popping in. But I'm glad to be here with you. Some of you I know, some of you I don't. It's great to meet new people always. Um, can everybody hear me and see me? That's the first thing. But anyway, so um, all right, welcome. Well, the first question, um, and so if you don't actually have the chat open yet uh, in your uh, Zoom, or if you're not familiar with Zoom and the chat, um, if you go down at the very bottom of the black Zoom screen, uh, on the very bottom edge, there's a little bubble that says chat. If you open that up, you can chat with each other during the um, during the, uh, the, the workshop. And um, also you can answer questions or during the, um, during the delivery part, or I guess, or the information part that I wanna share with you, um, you can put any questions or comments in there and then we can come back to them at the end. So um, yeah, so open the chat if you, if you don't have that open, that would be awesome. Um, and the first thing I wanted to ask you was before we jump into the solstice, this kind of leads into it a little bit, is um, how are you feeling, ladies? How are you feeling this holiday season? Are you guys feeling kind of wrung out by the season already? I don't know. I was done by Thanksgiving. <laughs> so if, you were, if you're feeling tired, wrung out, a little bit exhausted, you can type in the chat and just say yes and maybe add one um, adjective or one descriptive word as to how you're feeling um, uh, right now about the holidays. I'm, I'm feeling bone tired. Now I love the holidays or I used to, of course, before the last three years, but, um, I mean, it's true. I did get sick with the flu. I was running around with my son's wedding. There was a lot going on, but it really is more than that. It's really, it's been a tough three years of, I would say life-threatening and dramatic change on all kinds of levels. All right. Well, you know, we're all, in different phases of our life, but we're all in that sort of peri midlife menopause 
uh, time and it can be really challenging and in the holidays and with everything that's been going on with the flu and COVID and what's been happening in the last three years, it's a lot of long-term stress. And in a recent blog of mine, I wrote that, you know, it's okay to slow down and make adjustments and take time to rest. And this is one of the two sides of the solstice coin that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. In fact, rest is a requirement if we want to live a happy, healthy life. And I'm not just talking about rest at the end of the day or getting a good night's sleep, although those are important. I'm talking about deep, soulful rest. And it's important if we want to be in tune with our natural rhythms that that are part of our nature and that are in tune with nature as we age. So we're, we're a part of nature, we're related to Mother Earth, to Gaia, and she gives us all the clues and examples that I, I take and that I think all the clues and examples we need to rest and rehabilitate ourselves. So ancient, we're talking about the secrets of the solstice, and ancient peoples around the globe celebrated the solstices, recognizing that pause in the heavens, when for three days, it seemed like the sun stood still. The winter solstice marks the shortest day of the year. And on this day, the sun's movement on the horizon ends its southward journey that it began on the summer solstice. And then it begins to head back north. So I want to share with you some slides that I've put together that kind of illustrate what we're going through here. Okay. Share screen. Here we are. Share. All right. So, okay. Looking at um, the idea of the sun standing still in the sky, that it seems like the heavens pause at this equinox. This is a picture uh, taken in Sicily from the same place, right? On each night between or or on a, not each night but on a few nights in between the winter solstice and the summer solstice and it shows you how far the sun travels and how far it changes on the horizon from solstice to solstice so you can imagine being one of these ancient peoples who would stand and look at the horizon and would notice that the sun was moving across the horizon, north and south. And that this became some of the basis for the ancient calendars that these peoples developed. <laughs> Excuse me, still have a little bit of that, that flu cough. Now, as we know, many ancient cultures tracked the sun and the stars and the winter solstice has been celebrated for thousands of years. And these festivities influence the holidays that we celebrate today. And this is the other side of that solstice coin I was talking to you about is celebration. One is rest and one is celebration. And as we'll see, the two sides work together. One of the most familiar and ancient astronomical observatories and solstice markers is, of course, Stonehenge. Archaeologists believe that it was built over a long period of time in stages over thousands of years during what we call the New Stone Age. And this was when humanity was transforming from being primarily a hunter-gatherer culture to um, agriculture and farming. And it was a time that included the beginnings of pottery, weaving, and the raising, raising of livestock. And by the way, importantly enough, these were the inventions that helped humankind make the great leap forward from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age. And these were the inventions of women. Most archaeologists and anthropologists now agree that pottery, weaving, agriculture, and the raising of livestock were all inventions of women. So we moved, we moved humanity forward once, we can do it again. So Stonehenge is carefully aligned on a sight line that points to the winter solstice sunset and the summer solstice sunrise marking the two halves of the year. And the longest night, of course, the, the, the winter solstice, the sunset at winter, marks the beginning of the long dark of winter before the return to spring. And this is over that three night period. 
There are many other Neolithic and ancient sites in Britain and Ireland and Scotland that mark the movement of the sun and align with the solstice. In Scotland, for example, there's multiple megalithic structures. And in the northern part of Scotland where winters can be brutal, there are very few hours of daylight. So you can imagine if you had a calendar that told you, ooh, tomorrow the days actually start getting longer, that would be a really hopeful marker in the year. The meth, the meth, the megalithic, can't say that three times fast. The megalithic site Brunaboynia was built in what is now called New Grange in Ireland. Bru translated means other world or tomb. And the layout and circular form, some think, is symbolic of the female body. This is the entrance and the entry passage. And at New Grange, for 17 minutes at sunrise on the morning of the solstice, on the morning after the longest night, right? The light from the sun illuminates the triple spiral on the back wall. And it's thought that this may actually represent the spirit of new life coming into darkness and renewing the sovereignty of the land. And this same symbol is on the large stones across the entrance and on the stones across the back. And the direct line through the middle to the stone at the back and the stone at the front actually cuts Brunia perfectly in half. And we have to remember that these ancient peoples were constructing with stone tools. And the fact that they were able to measure so precisely is really incredible. And because Ireland wasn't invaded by the Romans, the Celtic tradition of the goddess being the spirit and the sovereignty of the land wasn't subsumed to the Roman perspective of worship of a male sun god. We may never know the mysteries of these great places because, unfortunately, there's no system of writing from Neolithic cultures. There are, however, a lot of symbols, glyphs, and carvings that when studied and cross-referenced by scholars, they find that patterns of meaning begin to appear. Now, these megalithic ancient solstice, equinox, and moon calendars exist all over the world, from South Africa, Germany, Canada, the Nubian Desert, Malta, Egypt, Sweden, Peru, Easter Island, New Mexico, Wyoming, Mexico, Cambodia, Scotland, England, Ireland, and more. They're all over the globe. And we may never know the exact meaning of all of these sites or who built them or exactly why and what their celebrations were, what they did for sacrifice and how they celebrated. But we do know that they tracked the movement of the sun and the stars and it gave them an understanding of the cycle of the seasons and how soon spring and warmth would return. What we do know, though, is that ancient pagan traditions of Celtic, of, try that again, ancient pagan traditions of solstice celebrations ha that have been passed down have influenced our holidays such as Yule and Saturnalia. Some of those traditions were adopted by early Christians in, and transformed into Christmas. And the word Yule is thought to either mean wheel or feast. The word solstice is derived from the meaning to stop or stand still. Although it's the longest night, it's also the turning point of the year. And following this night, the sun grows stronger and the days become gradually longer again. The festival of Yule is an honoring of the cycles of nature, a celebration of rebirth, and a reaffirmation and the continuation of life. In the northern and ancient Eastern European traditions of Lithuania and Latvia, early cultures worshipped sun goddesses who rode across the sky on the solstice in a sleigh pulled by horned reindeer. The Sami people or the Laplanders, the indigenous peoples of Nordic countries, were reindeer herders and they relied on them, of course, for their survival. Their sun goddess flew through the night on the solstice and the people smeared warm butter on their doorposts to nourish her on her flight. The, North, the Norse goddess Freya would spin the fate of the new year during solstice and Yule. The horn goddess, the sacred deer, is a goddess symbol throughout Northern and Eastern Europe. And in fact, it's the female reindeer who keep their antlers, not the male. The male shed theirs each season, 
So it's likely that the tale of Santa Claus riding through the sky in a sled drawn by reindeer is adapted from those ancient goddess traditions. So here we are now looking at some ideas of the ancient peoples, of some of these Neolithic structures, um, of how they were set up, the fact that they celebrated these dates, right? The fact that some of them were incorporated into our holidays. And so we're looking at this as I mentioned originally, as, as a two-sided coin, right? One I'm gonna say is about rest and recuperation and one is about celebration. It's an amazing and powerful time of year that, um, that, that we can use to, to not only to rest, but be creative and to celebrate. So I'm gonna go back into my slides and let's start here. Let's go here. Okay, so, all right. Before we stop to meet each other, I just kind of gave a little bit of a background on some of these Neolithic cultures, um, some of the, the huge structures that were built all over, basically all over the world um, to honor these solstices and to track these calendars and moon days and, and how important it was to these cultures. And and um and really in in the celtic tradition the the heart and the hind um are are sacred and it in these like they said in in um or like i said in the idea of the horned goddess or in the laplanders and the sami people the male reindeer lose their antlers it's the female who is so sacred who develops this glorious headdress right and keeps it from year to year to year so the longest nights of darkness symbolized so many different things to the ancients they equated nature with the great goddess or the feminine creative energies of birth and regeneration from the deep freeze and death came the spring darkness was sacred because from that long darkness came life. Just as we were formed in the womb in darkness, the seed is planted in the darkness of the earth to wait for the mystery of life to sprout forth in the spring. In the ancient Celtic tradition, the Holly King rules with the goddess as her consort from midsummer to the winter solstice. And so he was considered to be the Lord of the dying year. And at the winter solstice, the old king died. And on the morning after the um, old king died, then there was a new king was born and was known as the oak king. Born on the, the sunrise morning after the solstice, right? The longest night of the year, the great goddess went into labor and over that night, in the new light of the morning, the new sun, S-U-N and S-O-N, was born. When he grew, he became the consort of the goddess from the rebirth of the sun in the waxing year until he would lose a battle with the holly king at midsummer. And so the wheel of the year continued to turn. The oak king is also known as the green man. I had to show you this illustration. This, this as the green man, as the consort of the great goddess, just lights my candle. I love this image. I mean, I those the the eyes are so powerful and the illustration is so beautiful. Just wanted to share that with you. I just actually ordered it on Etsy. So you can give, you look for the green man on Etsy and you'll find this. Um Okay, let's see. I've got a couple of things in the chat. Just anything I need to see. Um, the pendant. Oh, the pendant is the symbol of the great goddess that he's wearing, right? It's the it's the symbol of the three, right? The the um it's the Celtic um symbol for the goddess, the three of the maiden, mother, and crone, as as we would interpret it, or as older cultures would interpret it. But as we were talking about 
we actually now are in four, which is part of my research and part of what I teach and part of my coaching. Um, I don't call it the um, the autumn woman, I think um, someone said, uh, but I call it the region. I, so, go ahead. You call it what? I, I say the four stages now are maiden, householder, because it's more inclusive of alternative lifestyles and people who don't have children, right? Regent, because, because we are, a regent is, can rule and can administrate and make her own decisions. And she holds the throne for her wise woman to come, right? Like a regent ruler would hold the throne until the child was old enough to rule, whatever. So those are the ones that I chose. It, it doesn't matter what the names are. It's just the concept that we're, we've, we've evolved from three to four. Yeah. So, so because the goddess reflects women and our life, then the goddess must now also be in four because we're living in four. But so um, looking at this image of the green man, right? So now the solstice is upon us. And the question remains, how will we celebrate this time of darkness? How are we going to use the three dark nights when the light of the sun stands still? What thoughts might carry us through the bitter winter and the deepest cold? My dog is whining at me. <laughs> Can we, uh, I, hold on one second. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to let him out. Excuse me. Yeah, you got to go out. I hear you. Okay, come on. Come on, go. Go. All right. He's really old and he usually sleeps through the whole thing, but not tonight. The, uh, the green man must have woken him up. All right, so um, sorry for the interruption. Okay, so, um, all right, so as I was saying, what thoughts might carry us through this bitter winter and the deepest cold? And can we find wisdom in the darkness? That's the question. Can we find rest and refuge in the sacred darkness of the concept of rebirth? In our culture, we've lost so much in our demonization of the darkness. Light is seen as good. Darkness is associated with fear and evil. Yet the cosmos is built on dualities. Light, dark, atmosphere, vacuum, matter, antimatter, sun, moon, male, female, up, down, in, out, and on and on, right? And there's light and there's shadow or darkness in each of us. When we ignore half of that equation, we risk becoming dangerously out of balance. We have our conscious and our unconscious mind. And through our unconscious mind, we are linked to the collective unconscious of humanity and all life on earth through the ancient threads of instinct, archetypes, symbols, rituals, myth, and the actual web of life itself. We have our waking, and our dreaming states, our complexes, our identity, and we have all that we suppress in our shadow. The darkness balances the light. The seasons and the earth will tell us when it's time to grow, to do, to tend, to produce, to harvest, and when it's time to rest, oh, to go fallow and dream. There's wisdom in the darkness. It invites us to slow down, to think, to consider, to imagine. It takes us out of our intellect and invites us to move back down into a bodily way of knowing. We've demonized the darkness and we can see it through our own language and our traditions. We have quote unquote dark thoughts or he, has a, he or she has a black heart that's dark money, and so forth. It carries it over into racism. It carries over into the demonization of women. Some of the female deities became branded as evil when one culture took over another. Lilith was branded as a demon. 
women became seductresses, not bringers of ecstasy and creators of life. Old women became hags and witches, not wise women, full of experience and knowledge. And the knowledge of herb lore, midwifery, and healing through nature became witchcraft. The deep knowing from within our bodies and our connection to the natural world, the seasons, and the moon became dark, evil, or sinful. That patriarchal shift that eliminated many divine feminine attributes from the light co-opted and redefined the creative womb of darkness and instructed us to run from it instead of resting in it. Now, depth and archetypal psychologies, which is what I studied, recognize that the light and the shadow and the gods and the goddesses within each of us exist simultaneously. It's like having a large cast of characters in your own personal play and your every character. The season of darkness, of long nights and fallow fields, it's nature's invitation to us. It's showing us that it's time for us to rest, to let our fields lie fallow for a time, to give over to dreams and imaginings. This way, we can plant new seeds of our hopes, our dreams, and our imaginings for the spring to come. Because no seed will germinate in the sun. First, it needs to be left in the darkness, in the cold, for a time, to prepare to sprout with the warm sun, longer days, and the rains of the spring. The impulse to curl up in front of a fire with a book, to read and rest, or knit and think. Oh, I see you knitting a net, right? To do handcrafts, spin and weave, right? To spin and weave the wool of spring and summer into the mantle of winter that allows us to dream, imagine, to be hypnotized by those flames. It's the rest that's offered lovingly to us by the darkness after such a long time of toil and stress, confinement loss, grief, worry, fear, and angst. And now we're here next week. We're here at the solstice once again, right? Our solstice, our long, welcoming, restful, fallow, transformational dark. The 21st is the first of the three nights where the sun will seem as if it's going to pause on the horizon. It's been rising, setting, rising, setting, rising, setting, rising, setting. And it's going to rise, set, rise, set, rise, set in the same place. We know as modern scientific humans, the sun is actually not pausing. But that concept that deep idea from the ancient peoples that the sun has stopped for three days, the celestial sphere, the celestial sphere, the circle of life, the wheel of Dharma is pausing. When that happens, it all becomes still. It's a cosmic pause. It's a concept. It's a metaphor. It's a symbolic living metaphor that signifies the promise and the possibility of personal rebirth. The sun is about to be reborn. It goes into the longest dark and it is about to be reborn and bring with it the promise of spring, of a new solar year. This is the hope and the promise in the pause and the turning of the great cosmic wheel of time. So it's time to trust in this metaphor. It's time to trust in what the ancients saw, felt, and knew from their relationship with the natural world. All of that knowledge, all of that instinctual archetypal knowledge is coded and available in the collective unconscious of humanity, 
we've all always been connected and we always will be. And that knowledge comes out of the fact that our body comes out of the earth. We are connected to all living things. It's one huge ecosystem. So it's time to trust in this cosmic pause and rest in that warm embrace. Whoops, went the wrong way. Of the star studded darkness within the womb of creation. This is our moment of unlimited potential when all things are possible. It is this pause in the darkness when we sink back into ourselves and we allow ourselves to rest and dream and imagine. In the darkness of the womb of creation, the realm of dreams and imagination, all things are possible. So saying yes to engaging in this metaphoric pause and engaging with these realms of psyche opens you to all these infinite possibilities. Our ancestors lived in the mythic time of nature and we can too, if we listen and heed its call. The solstice invites us to a leaving behind, a deep breath, a relaxing back into the fallow, the deep mystery of the dark. It's the seeding of new beginnings in the fertile soil that you've created in your psyche from all that you've learned and experienced and struggled with and encountered over the past year and over all your years. The cosmic wheel is pausing for three days, offering us the ability to participate in the ever renewing mythic cycle of death, rebirth, and new life. This is the realm of the great goddess. This is the womb and the tomb, her body, right? Being the womb and the tomb of all life. All life comes from it. All life returns to it. This is our opportunity to let die that which needs to die. This is the time to let go of whatever we're carrying within ourselves, our unfulfilled goals and dreams that no longer serve us and the greater good. By letting go of these things, we open ourselves then to the gift of great rest, of the fallow time, where just like the earth, we get to rest, a oh, deep rest, dream, and let the seeds of the new year lie protected of our new seeds, our dreams, our hopes, lie protected in the fertile ground of our being. So this is the end of the images, but I do want to wrap up with a couple of thoughts before we go into some discussion. In this celestial gift of suspended time, it's, it's, it's a moment of exquisite balance between light and dark at the solstice, right? And we can begin to understand that we are living in the tension between the light and the dark every day, between the blessings and the privilege of being alive and celebrating with those we love in the solstice season while simultaneously hoping to survive that long frozen cold that in our modern culture maybe now includes division, violence, injustice, pandemics, and more, not just the cold, right? During the solstice season, like the ancients, we celebrate with our loved ones. We gather in love and gratitude to celebrate what's good, what's loving and life affirming, right? And the ancient celebrations of solstice have become our holiday season where we celebrate the harvest at Thanksgiving, right? The miracle of Hanukkah, the miracle of light at Christmas, the birth of the new sun, the king, the bringer of light and so forth. And many, if not most of the holidays around the world this time of year celebrate the same mythic ideas it's the same mythic seed. It's the same flower that unfolds in a different culture. So these are great ideas, right? So what can we do to get this deep, fallow rest? First, you need to give yourself permission to rest. And you need to acknowledge that it's time to rest. Spend some time in nature outside. If you can, or if you're in the frozen tundra, observe it through the window and see how mother nature is resting 
The trees have dropped their leaves. The, field are em the fields are empty and often silent. Think about the idea of being in harmony with the cycles of the earth and nature. Maybe you'd want to paint or draw, collage, create, or journal about it. Keeping the idea in the front of your mind will keep it active and alive in your psyche. You can ask your inner self to explore these ideas in your dreams right before you go to sleep every night. Say, I want to rest in the fallow of the solstice, right? I want to rest in the, in the creative ground of this mother earth darkness, whatever words, however you want to call it. Ask your psyche to bring you dreams. Ask your psyche to show you these things and write down the dreams that you remember. It is possible to train yourself to remember your dreams so that you can keep a dream journal because some of the most powerful messages that you'll get from your inner self on your own transformation will come from your dreams. Simplify your schedule if you can. Oh, please, God, simplify your schedule. Make time to sit, have a cup of tea, a glass of wine, whatever you want. Read a book, sit in front of the fire, light candles, take a hot shower, a bath, take a nap, turn off the TV and turn off social media. Says someone who runs her business on social media, right? But turn it off. Journal. Writing down ideas and feelings, actually handwriting it, makes creative connections and deep psychological connections in your mind that are not made when you type on a computer. It's been proven in psychological studies. So write down your ideas and your feelings. It's one of the best ways to get in touch with the deep places of your psyche. Make a list of what you need to let go of. Ideas, dreams, goals, people, right? Write about the new dreams. Write about new inspiration, new ideas that might need time to grow roots. Don't dream them out to the end. Don't dream them out to their, to their consequence, to, 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 the, to the million dollars or the new lover or the whatever it is that people want to, or, or, or the perfect happiness, whatever people want to achieve. Just, just the idea of the seeds. What might be interesting? What might you need to do? Reassess your priorities. What worked for you last year and what needs to change? You know, when we, every year, right, people make New Year's resolutions. I never do. <laughs> but casting our hopes and dreams upon the fertile earth of our lives is no guarantee of a harvest. It's an invitation to watch, water, tend, weed, and learn. And we can learn just as much from what didn't grow what was planted in the wrong place at the wrong time under the wrong conditions as we come can from that harvest of plenty. The journey to becoming your own heroine, recreating yourself over and over, saying yes to the adventure and loving your destiny incorporates all that you learn from the bounteous and the barren times. This is the heroine's path. It's saying yes to the entire adventure. So. This time of transition, this three days that you can take for yourself can be very powerful. It can be the beginning of a fallow time if you decide to let yourself psychologically rest through the frozen months of winter and slowly begin to plant your seeds for new creative projects as the, as the spring comes. What I mean by a fallow time is a time when, when to be fallow means the field is empty. The field is empty and nothing is growing, right? After the harvest, right? Sometimes what the farmers will do is they'll go back with the combine and like if there's stalks left of the corn or of the wheat or whatever the crop was and they'll turn it over back into the earth. And then through the winter, the field lies fallow. And on the surface, it seems like nothing is happening. Nothing is growing. Nothing is sprouting. Nothing is um, 
producing, right? But during that time, the earth is resting, right? The seeds, right, of, of the wheat from the year before, they get turned under, right? Or the bulbs of the flowers from the year before. Everything is resting in that time in order to be ready, right, for when the earth warms, when the rains come, when the length of day, when the photo period is long enough that it stimulates the trees to push forth the buds. So the fallow time is that time when you're not trying to, that's not to, it's not to say that you don't have to go to work. If you have to go to work and you have to produce product at work in order to keep a roof over your head, yes, you have to go make product to put roof over your head. I'm talking about the idea of inner fallow time of, of, of sometimes I would, I'll say to myself, right? Oh my gosh. I have all these projects to do for my business. I have to get my podcast started. I have to get the, the second rewrite of my book done. I have to get it back to the publisher. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do all these things. I have to do, 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 go, 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 right? And do all of this. And the human psyche, if it is allowed to be in connection with the natural world, will in some ways, resist the go do, go do, go do, go do produce in these winter months. Because it's the time when there is nothing to do in the fields. There is nothing to harvest. You can't plant anything yet. What, they, what the ancient peoples could do is they could take the flax fibers and they could take the wool from the summer, from the, the uh, the spring shearing and they could start spinning and weaving. And that's a metaphor for us to spin and weave the ideas for what we want to create in our lives moving forward. It could be a fallow time. You could, um, you could create a fallow time for yourself once a week to daydream and drift. You could create a fallow time where you say, okay, for the next two weeks, I'm going to relax. I'm going to spend time in nature. I'm going to observe nature at rest. And I'm going to try to have my psyche also be at rest. There's no one way to do this. There's no right way to do this. What I'm trying to encourage you is to take and make space for fallow time in your deep psyche, right? That the solstice is this moment where it's the darkest night and there's a dying off of the old king. There's a birth of the new king. There's a celebration and feasting, right? And the welcoming of the new sun, which is saying spring is on its way. New creation is on its way. The, the, even though it's going to be cold and frozen for the next two, three, four, five months, depending on how far north you lived, right? Spring is on its way, right? The seasons are turning. The darkness will end. It's a, it's a moment of hope. It's a moment of reflection. It's a moment of death. It's a moment of letting go, right? Of, of whatever your old king is, right? Whatever your holly king is that dies at the new year. And the oak king that is born. Does that does that explain fallow a little better? Okay. So when you rest in this place, this is where the edges come in. This is where the liminal space is. A liminal space is a space that's a threshold. It's if you think of the threshold of a door. You're on this side, you walk across it, you're on this side. The liminal space is the actual threshold that you cross, right? And so when you pause in that space that's not here or not there, right? We could talk about this with, um, with menopause, or we could talk about this with relationships, or we could talk about this with um, with ideas or any kind of transformation. 
in that liminal space is, is where the change happens. And in that space, when you're not here and you're not there, it's what philosophers say is the space where you're in between being and becoming. Right? You're not being who you were. You are not yet who you will be. So in that liminal space is where the transformation begins. And then once you cross out of it, you've left one thing and then you've moved into the next. The edges are where all the growth happens. As Clarissa Pinkola Estes says, where the ocean meets the shore, that's where life teems, right? Where the stream meets the edge, that's where life teems. Where the deep forest and the edge of the meadow, that's where life teems, right? Not in the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean, right? That's, that's always dark and cold. It's on the edges that life is its most creative and most dynamic. And so what I'm saying about this solstice is it's an edge. It's a liminal space in between the old year and the new solar year. And there's three days where you can have creative darkness, where you can use that time to let die what needs to die, to rest, and to start thinking about what the seeds are. For, for transformation or what seeds you might, dreams, hopes, you might want to plant in the new year. So I just want to encourage you all to take some time to, um, to do this. We have a few minutes left. I want to know if anybody has any other questions or comments um, before I tell you about the downloads and all the other, the little gift I'm giving you and the other things. Does anybody have anything they want to add or ask or absolutely i mean you look at like the days of yule the 12 days of christmas all of these different holidays were all meant to span this time right, right. to take into effect this whole transition of the death of the old and the birth of the new. And as a metaphor, it's really, really powerful. Um, so I wanted to, you to know that um, if you're interested, um, I have two books that are published on my website. Morgan put the links on here. The Seven Realms of Change is a discovery journal. Um, these two books, uh, there's a coupon uh, that's in this text here in the chat um, for 15% off. And the discovery journal helps you track changes in your life for a year. Um, and it helps you to document, explore, and treasure your own personal renaissance. It's in full color. It's eight and a half by 11. It's 96 pages long. And it helps you track what's going on in your physical and, and mental health. And so it's also... Could you talk Oh my God, now Siri's talking to me on my watch. It, it tracks your physical and mental health, which is also great to have as a, um, as a touchstone for um, any physician's appointments or those kinds of things. Um, the other one is a little book on the um, myth of Ariadne and Theseus. It's called The Victory of Ar Ariadne, and it's a retelling, an archetypal retelling of the myth of Ariadne and Theseus. And it's a little book, it's for women who um, gave their all to someone or something and were abandoned, disrespected, or unappreciated. And women who've had this experience will relate deeply to the heart of the myth. Um, and that's a, a, a smaller book that's seven and a half by seven and a half in full color as well. And last but not least, I created a, a little, um, journal for you, a solstice um, journal, which is a free download. I will show, show you what it looks like here. Uh, this is a free download, which you can just click on the link and go right there and get it. Um, here it is. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a PDF that talks about some of what we've done. 
you can actually type right in it to journal if you want, or you can print it out and um, you can write in it old school if you want. And it just is a little, just a little gift, a little reminder, something that you can use, um, you know, over the three days of solstice if you want to kind of journal and touch back into some of the ideas that we've talked about. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to uh, let you know about those things. And, um, you know, you have my email. You can always reach out to me. Um, but, okay, so I just want to end with a blessing um, just for something for us to think about and just to really honor the fact that you've come and spent so much time with me. I really appreciate it. Um, and, um, I wouldn't mind having these meetings on, on Thursdays, Susan, I just picked Wednesday cause it's the middle of the week. <laughs> I have never know what's best for everyone, but, um, in fact, I have a lot of people on the East coast who won't join because it's so late, but I'm right, thinking about the solstice, just take a deep breath in. <sighs> we've shared so much great energy, so many beautiful stories, so much from your hearts. I am so grateful. So together during the light, during together during the nights of the longest darkness in ancient times we gathered and now we gather. We are descended of ancient mothers who had daughters who themselves became mothers, who had daughters. And ever so, it has continued since the beginning of time. I, your sister, call on the strength of that unbroken chain and honor it in you. For all that you've survived, endured, and accomplished in the past year. May you take your well-deserved rest in the long dark of solstice. May you welcome the fallow time of deep dreams and imaginings. And may you emerge renewed and refreshed with hope in the coming of spring. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And I wish you the happiest and healthiest of holiday seasons and the most magical of solstice nights. <laughs>